Chapter 1. What is Shared Decision-Making? Shared decision-making is a collaborative process that allows individuals and their care teams to make treatment decisions together, taking into account the best scientific evidence as well as individual values and preferences. Hi, my name is Pat Deegan, and I first learned about shared decision-making at the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in New Hampshire. Here's how it works. Imagine you or a loved one were newly diagnosed with breast cancer. Rather than immediately meeting with an oncologist to discuss treatment options, you would first go to the Center for Shared Decision-Making, located at the medical center. There you would find a library of carefully crafted decision aids and a nurse to introduce you to them. Decision aids are interactive tools that would help you understand your condition and your treatment options, including the option of watchful waiting, as well as the benefits and risks of each option. Importantly, the decision aid would also help you think about your preferences and values and to focus on how various options might affect the quality of your life. Using a decision aid, you would learn that mortality rates for women with early-stage breast cancer are relatively the same whether they choose lumpectomy, which is removing just the cancerous tissue, or mastectomy, which involves removing the entire breast. Now, even though the impact of both treatments on the cancer is about the same, these two options are very different in terms of quality of life. If asked, some women will feel strongly about breast preservation. Others will not. That means neither treatment is the right treatment for every woman. The decision to have lumpectomy or to have a breast removed is what is called a preference-sensitive decision. Preference-sensitive decisions require, from an ethical perspective, that a woman's preference be taken into account. Decision aids help prepare a woman to participate in shared decision-making with her oncologist. She can make notes, write down her questions, and indicate her decisional leaning or how sure she is feeling about which path to take. Finally, when she's ready, she can meet with the oncologist and together they can make the best decision about how to proceed. Rather than persuading the woman to choose one option over another, the oncologist trained in shared decision-making will strike a stance of equipoise, provide more information if required, and help support the woman's decision-making process. When I first saw shared decision-making in action, I said to myself, that's the kind of clinical care I want. Chances are you're thinking the same thing. There are at least four reasons why the practice of shared decision-making is compelling. First, shared decision-making is a compelling practice because decisions about treatment are not just medical decisions. Decisions about treatment are also personal decisions that affect us and those we love. Shared decision-making shifts the focus from what is the matter to what matters to you. What matters to us, our values and preferences, must be a central part of the decision-making process. Secondly, shared decision-making is compelling because for many medical conditions, scientific evidence is not definitive, it is incomplete, or it is open to more than one interpretation. In such situations, there is an ethical imperative to include people in the decision-making process. An example might be when a woman in treatment for bipolar disorder becomes pregnant. Should she continue to take mood-stabilizing meds? Should she discontinue medications? The scientific evidence to support one right choice is simply not available at this time. The data is equivocal, and in such cases, there is an ethical imperative to involve the person in shared decision-making. Third, Shared decision-making is compelling because in many instances there is more than one right option, as we saw in our vignette on early-stage breast cancer. In situations where there is more than one right option, it is important to match individual preference with choice of treatment. If we assume we can predict people's preferences, 
then we are at risk of making a preference misdiagnosis. For instance, physicians predict 71% of women would choose breast preservation as a top priority. But what do you think women with breast cancer said when asked? Well, only 7% agreed that breast preservation was a top priority. In truth, preference misdiagnosis happens all too frequently. Shared decision-making prevents preference misdiagnosis and helps us get the right treatment for the right person. And finally, a fourth compelling reason to adopt shared decision-making is that it is perfected informed consent. In everyday practice, there is significant drift away from obtaining informed consent. Shared decision-making, especially when supported by decision aids, is a higher standard and for that reason is increasingly being adopted by states and recommended in federal policy. There's good evidence to support the practice of shared decision-making. We know that when shared decision-making is combined with the use of decision aids, then people are more knowledgeable about the risks and benefits of treatment options. They have less decision regret and are more satisfied with their choices, and people are more activated and engaged in their care. Research also shows that shared decision-making holds the potential of helping to reduce health disparities, especially for folks with low health literacy. And finally, people who are involved in shared decision-making tend to be more conservative in their choice of treatments, resulting in lower health care costs. Now, not every clinical situation requires shared decision-making. For instance, shared decision-making is not a great idea if a person arrives in the emergency department with an acute, life-threatening condition. Similarly, when a person is severely compromised through acute intoxication or delirium, shared decision-making is not the best course. And if there is a clear gold standard of treatment in which the scientific evidence unequivocally supports one best option, Informed medical decision-making, but not necessarily shared decision-making, is recommended. An example might be the use of insulin in type 1 diabetes. In closing, let me say that shared decision-making is used for social decisions and not just medical decisions. For instance, there are decision aids for end-of-life care, choice of assisted living, and when to stop driving. This is Pat Deegan. Thanks for listening.